Fuck, it happens every goddamn time. I think there's going to be business, so I don't hit the record button, and all of a sudden we say something fascinating, and uh, and I've and I've missed it. Yeah. Luke, you're going to say something? No, no. It's just it's just frustrating that no, it's frustrating. I forget how much value you get out of. This is a great example. So again, what if I'll hit ask me, uh, Roger to ask me, uh, ask me a question. And I'm like, well, well, the problem is, is that there are things that we don't want to, some of us don't want to know. Right? I mean, you don't want to know them. I mean, what if, so what if at the end of their, our journey, uh, our search for a, div a divinity ends up being that the world is a, the universe is a vast irradiated wasteland and we're an error in computation right um it, not that the not that god is looking out for us not that god is like us or that we're in form but not only that there is no god but we're an error in computation which it looks like we are um uh and that the the universe is a vast hostile already ready to wasteland that that uh, it, that it will will eventually destroy all life. Okay, so now what do you do with that fucking answer? Right now, now we do that answer is you say, well, the only thing we do is take care of ourselves along the journey. I know, but why take care of ourselves when the journey goes nowhere? Well, I mean, for the joy of the experience of taking care of each other to the till the end. I mean, I don't, you know. So you end up with this. These you said, well, what if you're the person that needs that? that positive belief that there's some good behind everything, right? In order to just get through daily life because you're not like us, which is possessed of intelligence, personality, and circumstance that allow, you know, that allow us to tolerate it no matter what it is, right? Um, but if you're one of those people, well, it would suck. Right? Well, you know, what do they do whenever that happens? They insert mysticism. What's mysticism? It's lying to yourself, right? used to lie to yourself so so i mean you know there's the the problem is you 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 have to find a way to let let a person continue going forward are you to to to, to persist to um to find whatever joys they can in life without telling lies to yourself that are debilitating. <laughs> so, so you have to, it's like panning for gold. <clears throat> Which lies do I got to keep alive in there? <laughs> While I sit through the ones that don't. And I'm like, okay, now therapy just became a fucking nightmare. Right? Because if you're looking for truth, it's fine. If you're looking to serve, serve through whatever you can to preserve whatever lies are necessary you know my, mom, I love, my mom's a great example just she had, goes from a devout catholic all the way up to saying everything that's that's atheist except for saying she's an atheist you know what i mean it's just it's just funny right to go through that but that was apparently something she needed It's just the art of being human. And anyway, so we were for the audience. We were talking about um, about about uh, how psychology is a started out as a feminine product. And I, I didn't catch your Luke's piece there. Is that of course it is. It started out uh, being the study of insane asylums, which were filled with women at the time. So of course it's a feminine. Uh, it's a feminine. Uh, Oh, method of bias to the thinking, and I'm like, I just saw it as Freud being a member of his community, and of course they think in feminine form. But I didn't put together that, of course, their subject matter was feminine, also. So of course, Freud self-selected into solving this problem, and the two things self-selected there into a uh, natural expression of their internals, but. Um, once you, and then, then Brandon, of course, did what he always does, race to the fucking end and reduce it to its nut, which I find, I don't know why, 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 
Well, I find it human. I find, Brandon, whenever you jump to a conclusion that's reductive, I find it more humiliating somehow than walking through the logical process. You know, when I say, okay, well, you know, it's psychologies, re, we've reduced psychology to causes and first causes and first causes, but first causes aren't the same as an experience, experience, experience right? But that once you've got the difference between responsibility, right, and irresponsibility, empathy. So systematizing and empathizing, all of a sudden, you know, all of psychology becomes pretty obvious. Of course, then Rana leaps to the fucking end result and says, well, psych what did you say? Psychology acquisition solves. Yeah, acquisition. Uh, acquisition. Acquisition is something. The way we teach psychology, right? Yes. Man works to acquire, acquiring the things you desire, and then <laughs> having the world, you know, not collapse in on you. That yes. be that that feeds into you growing as a thing. We don't solve for states in our science. We oh, solve for the trans we solve for the transactional ethic between states. You can't desire to be something or hope you were something before. <laughs> you can only work towards where you're going and do a good job working. Yes. And we only we only command that you work a particular way. Not bad. Uh, the, the, uh, embell embellish that a bit. So we only demand that you work a particular way and when you say not bad ah you you move through life with consenting fully informed right, rational productive choices between those in your in group so you can achieve something better you know, raise the floor for everybody right. so we don't tell what to do we tell what that there's only it doesn't matter what you do as long as it's what not to do it's not what not to do right? <laughs> It's hard on people. I use a lot of uh, I use a lot of double negatives to trap people. You know, it's not not that. Yes. Right. Because then you have to go. Oh well, fuck. What is it? Yes. You have to sit there for a second and think with it because it is something, and it's not being bad. And we can measure, <laughs> we can measure that with it with every interaction all the time yeah. when you're dealing with this place. Any t the question in philosophy isn't what. We ought to do it's what we ought not do which is disturb the order currently because you don't know if it'll break this place yeah <laughs> so uh i didn't get it on video but the way brandon said it was reductive he said well it's just uh, acquisition you know we're all acquiring we're all out to acquire things and we're happy if we get them and unhappy if we don't. And there's something more to it than that. <laughs> okay. And I, I like I've been to. so obsessed with what's creating the differences that I that I or, which I overstated the, the fact that there are differences. It's not it's not getting what you it's actually correct prediction that upsets people. It's when you predict wrong, meaning if you predict your life is gonna go bad and then it goes bad, like you don't get emotionally dysregulated. Your life is bad but your emotions don't get rocked out of place. It's when you guess wrong. And against this place with all this information and all the chaos happening, people can't guess right. They are being trapped in dysfunction. They cannot get out without what we're offering them. So when I started to, because this is where we are really, so what's the purpose, of, you know, that's another one. What's the purpose of religion? Generating mindfulness, right? Well, what is what is mindfulness? It's not worrying, right? What is not worrying you is all that? It's, because you can make correct prediction. And those cor cor correct predictions uh, eliminate um, uh, your fear of being left behind, especially the social aspect. But it also eliminates your stresses from failure. Right? So we're trying to produce correct predictions in people with a religion. And what you're trying to do with groups of religions, the groups in a religion, is trying to get everybody to use the same system of weights and measures so that you you can cooperate maximally with the most amount of trust, with the least amount of defection, causing the least amount of harm. So um, that's what religion is for. So what's the difference between what we're saying and me? 
Stoicism was trying to give you rituals to overcome, but what's the difference between what we're saying and a religion? In natural, words, law. Natural, huh? law. natural law is a religion. I mean, it's artistry and human action. It's spirituality and transcendence. <laughs> Yeah, can find, it can find your choices to transcendence. Is it a religion or is it, is it a religion or does it produce the ends? So this is the thing is whose definition of religion? Because we don't sell a false promise. Yeah, I mean that's the thing is a religion sells a false has to sell a false promise, right? That's what they bait you into. But if you're not baiting anybody into mindfulness, right? You're saying you'll get this. So what's the difference between a religion and a discipline? But doesn't it fulfill the same purpose? What if we create a social contract like the the Constitution, like we talk about, which is thorough and it's all non-false and it produces mindfulness, cooperation, and all other good things? Is what's the difference between what we're saying in a non-false religion? Is there any other non-false religion? No, there isn't really. There can't be because we don't. We don't bait anybody into it. We don't have to. We promise people to do it. And it's a promise. Right? But it, it's not a false promise. So I, I'm trying to get through this sort of aspect of it is you want to be associate. In other words, does the unification of the sciences end up in the unification of science, philosophy, and religion. Does that make sense? So you end up, we end up unifying all three. I'm watching faces here because I'm doing this off the top of my fucking head without prior analysis. Um, uh, what's the, it, in other words, the grand unification it unifies religion too, right? I mean, well, I think. Only in so far that it describes it. Can you um? Yeah. Uh, can you, I don't, can you help, help me with that? That's I think that's important. Well, I disagree with Brandon that natural law in itself is a religion. Yeah. You can judge whether a religion conforms to natural law. Certainly, but natural law, like any other, law, is just a description of causality that's correct yeah. well, it gives you the, it gives you the criteria to measure good religions against well let me let, let me try something else like, i don't know because uh, marty you tend to be extremely good at understanding civilizations right even you, you, and so but let me try this again so it's hard uh it's not so easy to see right now but it certainly was when I was growing up, is that there's almost no difference to a uh, classical liberal and American. When people call, when they call themselves Americans, um, there's no difference between the scripture in the Bible and the scripture in the Constitution. In other words, they're equal scriptures. <clears throat> and that's one of the reasons that, that, that people get, get right where the conservatives get all... Uh, get all up in arms about the Constitution. Because from their standpoint, it's Scripture. Now, the truth is, it might as well be Scripture. Um, a little off. Well, the Scripture is a little bit off, but so is the, so is the Scripture of the Constitution. A bit off. So, so um, <clears throat> the, the fundamental pro problem I see is that when I was taught the Constitution and American history, I was taught it like religion. In other words, I was taught the mythology of the founding, right? You know, George Washington, Cherry Tree, you know, all the fucking nonsense, right? Um, and so you were taught this religion, and and it's really, really was this two religions: the Christian religion and the Constitutional religion, and that was part of the American experience. And we know when they started undermining it because it was fucking in every. I mean, everybody got it. This is what part of being indoctrinated was. So I'm like, well, so I'm, I'm testing this, Martin, is that I don't know if it can't, when you say it's a system of measurement, but the story around it is what creates the, the religious aspect 
of them. Okay, that's different, right? Yeah, no, I'm I'm trying. Any, I'm any, working through this off the top of my head online with you because I know you're going to have a thought. You had a thought there, and so I'm just thinking it through. Is that is the problem then? Um, is the problem then that in order to produce a religion, you need a mythology, a story. In other words, is a system of measurement or not? Whereas if I go back to biblical stuff, there's a lot of stuff in there, but Ten Commandments are essentially property rights. So if it's, mm -hmm. you know, there's, there's, you know, there's no other law but the, this, right? Uh, every single one of them is, uh, there's no, the first two, I can't remember what they are, but the, the other eight are all property rights. Um, and so if you say that, then you've all of a sudden got uh, the the net you've got natural a sort of natural law in very primitive terms and and eight commandments plus two that say um, you will there's no other law but this natural law and you will ritualize the respect for this law uh, one day with some amount of your time and the other eight are just you know property statements of property or property of that so uh, I'm sitting here saying well then that's the system of measurement. And that. I could, if I think about, I could, can't do it off the top of my head, but I can tell you what the logic is under Islam, right? It's about the same. And so it's just more encompassing. But uh, that Islam's property rights definition is quite different because they were, they were tri more tribal than the Jews were. Um, so if I look at this, I'm like, well, is it the religion the logic or the myth you know there's the law and then there's the myth so, the, so in order to produce a religion on top of natural law what's the what's the myth that isn't false history well there has to be a virtue to it right this is, I think we can do that too but it is history we've got the history right I mean it's just I mean, it's history. We have a flawed history as people. They're the ones arguing for it to be the human race. You want well, is that why they, is that the what <laughs> they were doing with the um, that's what they were doing then with the um, Whig history? They're trying to make a mythos. Yeah, that's what they were doing. This, but you know, Whig history. You know what that means now? Does that make sense? Whig history is the idea that it's been ever made <clears throat> progress. Yeah, okay, so they're trying to do that instinctually. And so the German version failed, the Whig version failed, and it seems like the French version somewhat succeeded, and the Jewish version is the one we're sort of dealing with in competition now because it's a really, it's even better false promise than the. Well, who wants to be in a suffering competition with Jesus? Seems like just a terrible thing to go about doing. Well, I mean, if you if you're trying to, so how do I put hospital? One second, heard a little. Sorry about that. Um, I wouldn't take it if it was the hospital. God knows what that means. Um, um, but anyway, um, so you need a myth. You, so your myth, well, history is always a myth, right? You, it's the parts you include, the parts you leave out. You're trying to create a, you're trying to create a narrative, a parable, a lesson in consistency. Of, okay, fine. So I'm not yeah, sure yeah. we trapped ourselves out of, I meaning we record almost everything now. So... History is becoming quite objective, given the balance sheet we're starting to keep. Well, I mean, no, all sorts of interpretations still get imposed on top of the facts. Say again, Martin, interpretations what? Of all sorts still get imposed on the facts. You can still get total nonsense out of it.
Okay, so a truthful religion, at least false, excuse me, a non-false religion, the system of measurement is the natural law, is possible. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So let me bring back the original question that started us on this little journey through from psychology to religion. Is um, do, do you find mindfulness in what we do, what we in our work? I, mean, I, I, find, I find decidability in it. Right, but yeah. Well, <clears throat> I'm unsure that people are going to find mindfulness first, meaning they are dysfunctional and their emotions are not good feedback for them. That's what they're fighting. So you can decide even if it feels bad, knowing that the decision is optimal and tune yourself to the correct decisions. Because it doesn't come the other way around. Otherwise, you'd be a woman. Their emotions are correct. You feel your emotions. It doesn't mean they are right. I think you you touched on it earlier when you were mentioning you know predictive accuracy is what we're what we're looking for right and I think in a lot of ways it, it may not be how we define religion but that's what religion produces it, it produces a way to navigate the unknown and the unknowable right without the dysfunction right? mm -hmm. that's kind of what, what the purpose of, of mindfulness and and one of the big tools that we offer in that endeavor is decidability once you develop the capacity for decidability, then the unknown and the unknowable doesn't pose the same threat it did before you develop decidability, because you now have another skill to navigate that unknown un unknowable. So well, for me, the, the work has certainly eliminated all sorts of friction from thinking, uh, all sorts of false conclusions I would otherwise arrive at. But I wouldn't say I'm mindful now. Yes. I have a pretty clear attention deficiency. <laughs> um, uh, we're, we're illuminating something that you actually have to act it out. Meaning you can't just discuss it. It's something that you have to embody. That's what makes it yeah. real. That's what makes it real. That the mindfulness comes with the embodiment, not just the thinking it through. There are plenty of people who can think it through who are no, not conscientious, and that requires actual training, putting your hands on this place. Which, I'd make the case further that that requires a community, because no one is self-motivated in that. Not many people are self-motivated in that fashion. Uh, it's, it's that saying that your five best friends are, are the ones you hang out with most, that I mean who you are. Um, what I see is um, is the, the negativa it's a big advantage to preventing people from lying and, and misleading them. Um, there's a big advantage in creating an environment in which it's very difficult for people to offer you false promises. And over time, it's very easy to see the same effect in social sciences that we've seen in physical sciences, which is the normalization of a non-false set of intuitions about the universe. So the question is, if the via that's that's the that's the external part. <laughs> well, that's a defensive the flip side the via positiva is what do I have to really know? Truth, reciprocity, demonstrated interest, and truth. <laughs> right? And, I mean you can memorize, I mean we can like I said, we can I mean theoretically you could teach it as a equivalent of a prayer, but a uh, recitation, I mean, for a fucking six year old. I mean, if they don't understand all of it. And a, I remember saying that I remember had being taught to to memorize the, our father and what's the other one? The, 
The, Hail Mary? No, the long one. The, the one you... Oh. The, no, that, it's you Apostles have to do the long Creed, one. The Apostles' Creed. Okay. Right? Because you have to do those in church, right? You have to do that. So my mom made me memorize those, and I had to stand up on the little footstool thing and say it with the rest of the community. Um, so those are the two. And I remember that being fucking hard and not re not really understanding what I was saying. Right? But you could do it. Um, um, and over time, it became programmatic. Right? Well, the same thing is with reciprocity or you know, demonstrated interests and testimony. It's about the just slightly more slightly more words, but certainly accessible to to a little kid. So we had we had kindergartners pledging allegiance long before they understood what pledge or allegiance means. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's not impossible to teach this. I mean, if you have all these freaking guys memorizing the Quran, and Jesus, that's a fucking nightmare. Uh, we can certainly have people memorize. Uh, some sort of oath, truth, uh, tr uh, truth, reciprocity, and demonstrated interest. Um, yeah, sure, why not? I mean, you can't, that should be able to work. But is that, but now you need, I don't know, what's, what's your archetype for that? Is it Jesus your archetype for that? Huh? I don't know what your archetype is for. No, Jesus was solving a different problem. <laughs> yep. We don't have an archetype for that. I mean, technically, it, you, you could argue the best, the closest we have is um, Aurelius, but we can't really do better than that. Anyway. What problem are we solving? What? Yeah, the archetype. What problem is it solving? Uh, the it, it reduces who you. Uh, it's it's uh, an archetype or a personality dramatically reduce it reduces the abstraction between the concepts you're trying to get across and the uh, accessibility. In other words, it's really easy to imitate because we don't. Have, it's we all can. I mean, monkeys. I mean, it's Jesus with agency. Right, but, or Jesus with the ability to operate at scale because he was always going hey we don't have the capacity to operate at scale you have to submit to this place as it is and help those around you to the best you, you know to the best of your abilities in other words it's it's not in it's not a general right right, right. it's, it's yeah, more like start, a Saul yeah. Invictus type of Jesus right I mean you're I mean, do we need, do we need to cover that in just one archetype? Probably not. That's a really smart question. Probably... One of the one of the problems with Jesus as the archetype is he doesn't project a martial character to demonstrate restraint or responsibility. No, it does. He's telling you to be responsible. That's what you're saying. So, uh, yeah, so the, the, I like the big, three, the, the big three to me with, with an archetype with, in, the threat, in the frame of religion is that, that you know, the restraint, responsibility, and, and reciprocity, right? If, if we can embody those three in an archetype, then we're doing pretty good. <laughs> Well, I, mean, I think I think, he, I think he covers two of those, but he doesn't cover rest, restraint very well. Right. Because slave, sl slaves weren't in a, a martial <laughs> group, right? I mean, that's so. I mean, you get back to the you, you would need need a family. The primary values it's, it's of Jesus is charity. Yeah, it's the mother and self sacrifice, obviously. So you need the other two. You need restraint and reciprocity. Yeah. I like your casting of restraint. Can you talk about that a bit? See if it can this 
caused me to make any the, rest the restraint part yeah when you say in other words that's a very elegant way of expressing masculinity um because you can only i mean it's 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 perfect really because you have to have something to respond well, it, it, it's where that, that whole notion of the meek shall inherit the earth comes from. It actually wasn't meek. It was the restraint. The restraint will inherit the earth, right? Those that are capable of violence, but elect not to, elect to choose, you know, elect cooperation or uh, elect to refrain from violence are the, are the ones that will inherit the earth. It, it, I've, I've long said that, you know, only those capable of violence can offer peace. Because if you sure. can't choose something other than violence, you're not actually offering peace. You don't, it's not available to you to offer. You are subjugated or compelled to, to engage in whatever activity results from peace. You are not offering peace as an alternative to anything. right? So it's not actually peace. You're not, there's no sense, there's no, you can't promise peace if you're not capable of the opposite. Right, exactly, right. You and, can't you know, promise, and you tie, tie that back to restraint. You can't promise restraint if you're not capable of the opposite. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, if you're not, yes, if you're not capable of effectively violence, right? We need, we yeah. need, we need a, a, a we need to restore the virtue of violence. Right, yeah, exactly. And that's how we to need, restore the virtue of violence. Yes, is yeah. That, is that it's a resource. The, the big, it's it's the, a resource, the, and that resource can be applied good or bad. Right, and, and I think that's the big failing of, 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 of the, the, uh, the, Christian religions is that it, it it effectively takes violence off the table as as a virtual response or as, as a virtuous response, and they don't have a, a model in there that that maintains it, and so everything built on it. All, it's all it's, the, all the it's dependent upon the male right. violence, right? Right. right. This uh, like Judea was dependent upon the male host. And so, so it takes it takes cooperation for granted, which which undermines cooperation itself, right? It goes, it goes back to that concept of if you can't say no to cooperation, you're not doing cooperation. You're doing something other than cooperation. Well, in order to say no to cooperation, you have to have alternatives to cooperation available and accessible. Right. This is where how do you how do you usually say that? Um, if you got to have if you can't say no, it's not cooperation. Right. Right. Yeah. So if, if you're, it, it, I mean, in a, in a very real sense, if you're incapable of violence, then you're also incapable of cooperation. Right. What opens the door, when you are capable of violence, what opens the door to cooperation is restraint. Yes. I would take I it out of it without violence, uh, morality is impossible. That's correct. Right. Yes. It also goes back to that you know concept I've been talking about for a few years now about there's no such thing as a passive virtue. These are all active things. E even when you're choosing to not do something, that's that's the virtue of restraint. That's right. in the frame of restraint, right? I mean, we talk about it a lot when we say you know foregoing opportunities. I love or, restoring you know, the virtue of violence. So. I love restoring the virtue of violence. You have to be necessary. You have to be capable of violence in order to claim you're doing good. The moral man is a dangerous man. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, that that's the reason why our societies converge to reciprocity. Because right. there's presence of violence for reciprocity. Yes. Uh, without that limit removed. <laughs> Morality can go in all sorts of crazy directions, as we see. That's that. That's also why I include the female forms of undermining as forms of violence, because they can also extend restraint to their forms of violence or non-cooperation and non-avoidance. Right, all the things that don't fit into the alternatives to violence. Right. You you are right about that, and it still bugs me. It's just a word that bugs me. I know you're right. I just want to find another way of saying. Right, I get it, but but that's why I say it that way. It's yeah, no, that's I, it's the frame yeah, for restraint. You're right. You're right. Well, there are <clears throat> these are. These How are often do I tell you you're right? I'm mean, gonna tell you you're right all the fucking time. 
we're we're disambiguating something that's core here and the insight that comes out of our group all the time is we can't go backwards the abrahamic religions look like uh, they operate together meaning judaism christianity and islam like they fill holes where the other ones are lacking and christianity broke off into uh, roughly three branches and that's just the three points of the social triangle as well so i'm unsure if we're masculinizing masculinizing christianity because jesus is a feminine archetype for masculine people to integrate into their persona so that they exhibit charity and so on and we're not just like, removing the unhealthy violent tactics from judaism and islam is it because those were the where Christianity is weak, Judaism is strong in the feminine, and Islam is strong in the masculine. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the idea set did manifest a, a complete thing. It's just broken. It's broken off into factions that don't cooperate with one another. They seek monopoly. They seek. Say that again. A monopoly. They seek monopoly. And that's the that's the problem with Christians. <laughs> It's a law of force. It's a deterministic, right? Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, it's a law of force for us to adjudicate disputes between group strategies, just as it does between people. Mm -hmm. Same. And now we're bumping up against, like, who can do it? If you must be able to have the violent capacity in order to cooperate, there's not that many of us. We can all develop it. <laughs> yes and must must sure one of the, one of the big problems is with you know the last several generations is we've gotten ourselves so far away from developing it that it's not even an option for for many people right now i don't know there's a lot of people out there that think they're cooperating right now that aren't <laughs> well yeah i'm sorry i have a i'm working through this in my head because um i grew up in a violent condition i was in a lot of fights and um it feels really good um and when, thankfully when i matured i was about 16 or so 16 and i was beating a guy with a shopping cart and i'm like i could go to jail for this and my life could be over and um well, to be if you're, I'm not, you know, Brandon and I are not big guys, right? I mean, I'm heavy than you, but, um, you know, you, when you're not a big guy, you have to go all in. Uh, you can't play the policing game. You go all in because uh, you have to end it, right? And um, so that's what I learned. But the problem is you realize at some point, wow, this is extremely fun. And um, that's, and I'm, but then again, what makes you say, okay, this is fun, but this isn't good. <laughs> For me, it was, oh my God, I could kill this guy. I could go to jail for this and my life could be fucking over and I'm never, ever, ever going to lose my temper again. Right. Um, so but I, I, I'd love to see that, that distinction come back where we stop saying violence is bad and we start saying your lack of restraint is bad. Yes, which is the correct answer. I think women just don't like us ability to use violence because then they can continually undermine us. I mean, if there's no, there's no, no, uh, there's no reciprocity. So, you know, I, I'm like, the minute a woman is using undermining, she's crossed a line. And they used to know that. You know, we don't. There was a response. To that. Yeah, they oh, used to, not... women used to know that, is that you just didn't say things to guys that cross the line, right? You can swear at them and call them whatever names and stuff, but you, you really aggress against the guy. So un undermining is the application of the group's violence. Yes. Whereas the masculine I, violence is individual. You just solved the problem. Thank you. Thank you. You solved the problem. Well, that's a non-trivial philosophical problem. 
So it was alternating scale, right? Oh, Between the two polarized strategies. Say it again. It's always alternating when you move through the scales of reality. Yeah, that was alternate. Because we check one another. The answer to fem female violence, masculine violence. That's how you put a limit on it. Mm -hmm. Uh, you, you solved it, but I'm sorry. I'm just kind of stuck on this because it solves a lot of problems. No, it's not good. It's so in personal, in, interpersonal violence versus social versus uh, social social violence. Well, I mean, you can still you know, basically because of what do women do? They rally betas to kill men. And help us. And that's how they do. And we've, and we've designed a whole legal structure to support that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've been using the term conflict avoidant. I think that's wrong. And I think they're resolution avoidant and they're starting conflicts. It's just not them who are in the conflicts. Can you say it again for the... Sure. Well, I use the term conflict avoidant. Females are conflict avoidant, but they don't actually avoid conflicts. They have someone else fight them. So yes. they're resolution avoidant because they want their asymmetry to play out in the world. So they call in an authority yeah. right? or they or they undermine. So th there is... So there, some, there, some people so are is, conflict avoidant. Violence. Yeah, it certainly can be. That's the difference. Or, or it can only exist within the frame of violence. Correct. You couldn't get away with it without that, without that pull or, or, or ability to draw from the group's violence. I was too focused on the. Um, I was too focused on the um, individually at it, and that makes no sense. Because females, all female antisocial behavior is um, inward, inward uh, misbehavior that manifests is undermining an external social behavior. Okay. Well, we just watched it at scale with the crypto fiasco. You have a guy bait everybody into lending him money using the most attention grabbing voices he could, saying he was going to redistribute the funds because he's good. They were just abusing compassion. Be compassionate, join our project. You'll be rich and good. I, I, I uh, love what we're learning from this because uh, it's so predictable. And he said uh, last night or uh, yesterday, I didn't know that's what we were doing. Well, I mean, the argument I made in 2008 is they don't know that's what they're doing. He is going to be called a liar for saying that and scapegoated, even though the banks do exactly what he does all the time, all yes. the time. Well, but but this is the issue is that um, don't, don't, uh, isn't that what women do, which is what your point was. Right. Can you, can you exactly the same. That at all? Can well, you they can't that? be the at the bottom. They cannot be held responsible because they will not be violent. So the the final judgment doesn't come down upon them. It comes down upon us, right? Till it doesn't. But we box them out of that perception. Biology boxes them out of that perception. Having children boxes them out of that perception. Us treating them as elevated things, which we should, boxes them out of that per perception. They've internalized the perception that we don't hit women. Like, civilized men don't, right? And castrated men don't. But it's not off the table. Violence isn't off the table. We're, we blind. I like the conversation about violence. Frankly, we can't talk about it anywhere, right? Especially where we release these videos. But it's the obfuscation of the equilibrative force that affords for the redistribution. So to, to block it out of the conversation is insane. Well, I think this is the old, the tradition of you can slap a woman for misbehavior, and that's usually enough. But you can't beat a woman, right? Right. That that's just wrong. Um, Even the worst groups in the world hold uh, beating women, but they will they will kill you as a man okay. for beating your and wife. You be, even, but but it's like Sean, the Sean Connery argument. You know, she. Women need slapping, and uh, I actually are. You know, I can't say I've engaged in it, but I certainly have found 
it would have solved many issues, right? Um, but uh, mostly because of the what they don't like, which is we call it the Karen factor, but it's really just hysteresis, right? It's really hysteria. And um, the way you correct hysteria is you behaviorally limit it. And the way you do that is physicality. And what's the reason? Because there's no reasoning on, you can't reason with hysteria. Right? Right. You have to take it to the physical. Um, and so uh, I've been, uh, you know, I mean, I, I, of course, I'm in favor of a punch in the face for men and a slap in the face for women. I mean, I'm just in favor of that because it's it, it's like, an armed society is a polite society, right? I mean, it just, it's easier. It's easier to digest knowing that we we would posit a martial society. It's like you're going to grow up in fights, learning how to be physical, using weaponry, putting your hands on one another. It's not like it's outside of the bounds of human to human interaction. In this society, it is. It looks for what we're talking about scares people. And to Luke's point, like if we were just like, all right, well, you guys can adjudicate your disputes with violence tomorrow, we wouldn't get. The equilibration we would get chaos yeah because they're not fit they're unfit the I mean, what's the reason duel? for the duel the duel was so that you and i had an out right you, if we were, we didn't really have to have the fucking thing yep, right but if it was a matter of real pride we had a vehicle but you weren't supposed to kill the other fucking guy right now <laughs> But snowflakes melt at 10 paces, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, you know, you mentioned that the, the problem, it goes all the way down to the kids, right? We have all these anti-bullying pushes in school and whatnot. You know, the, 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 the teasing and the group asserting influence and stuff on, on other kids, that's part of how you develop and maintain norms. It starts right. down there, right? The kids should be having a fistfight from downtown. But it, 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 it goes back to that. They should, bullying should be in, in a, a lack of restraint, not a lack of violence. Like that should be the okay. definition. Uh, of can you? You're gonna. Uh, I I went down a bunch of rat holes while you're talking about that, trying to figure all the permutations of it, and I didn't. And I'm now I'm not sure which what you're recommending the right behavior is. Oh, <laughs> um. So I, you know, I think that there should be some um, making fun of each other as kids. There should be some resolving conflict using fit force as kids. All of those things need that. That's when we're learning how to do these things safely and, and productively, right? And the, the adults around us should be allowing us to navigate that, that unsafe environment in a safe manner, right? That's when we should start developing this stuff. But with all the push recently for, for anti-bullying and no bullying and whatnot, we've really driven this violence is unacceptable no matter what down into even our, our young children can't be physical with each other anymore right and so they're not getting that the, the reinforcement of norms at those levels they're not getting the development of restraint at that level we're, we're having we're calling people adults that have never practiced the restraint of violence in their life and we're calling them adults. never in other words we're we're not producing self-regulation it's like your right. argument of you can't you can't have uh, you can't have peace without violence you don't have self-regulation if you're not capable of self-dysregulation Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so, but again, it's because we're making violence the bad thing instead of lack of restraint the bad thing. Right. Bullying. Well, that goes be... back to what they did when I was a kid. Is it they the, they broke you up, and you had to then you and everybody watched you fight. Now you're now all of a sudden it's a social thing. Right. Right. And like you don't want to fight in those circumstances. Right. Because you're going to be humiliated or you know, you're going to be judged. <laughs> Right. Right. And so uh, I and I'm like, why did we take that away? You know, I mean, I remember getting a fight. I won't say his name because he's still living, getting a fight with this kid. And we were actually friends. Like, I don't want to really be in a fight with this guy. And I don't want everybody to fucking hate me. Right. I mean, that's the reason. <laughs> okay. This plays this ties your whole. Thing together i like that well the, the the problem we've run into we've integrated so many conflicting group strategies where the definition of restraint is different for each of those groups that we can no longer allow those types of activities because that we place restraint at different places so, yeah, you never develop responsibility right i mean it's it's i, I don't I mean, even that, know that's the thing right you're, what you're saying is that 
uh, restraint without restraint, you have no responsibility, right? And all three, you have no agency. All three of those are dependent on each other. Restraint, responsibility, and reciprocity, they all are intertwined and depend on each other. And they're all developed using each other. As children, I mean, we start learning them by using them in and, in and around each other. Those okay, three so, triggers. So we all know this because we're all right? So what about what do you, so I'm trying to envision the person listening to this and saying, but I don't want to fight. You, you'd never be in the fucking position. We're not saying you have to. <laughs> if you're that much of a pussy, you're never going to get in the situation. Anyway. Uh, I mean, you don't always get a choice. Yes. Well, and, and that's the thing. There's, there's a very big distinction between I don't want to fight and I can't fight. Uh -huh. People conflate those two as the same. Correct. And what you want? I is don't want to means I choose not to. Right. I can't means I. You don't have a choice. So what do we do about real bullying? Bullying. So as a kid, like I bring up the the Bobby Lee story, right? This kid, I ended up fighting at least once a week at the bus stop right? my whole fucking life, and he turns out to be a fucking murderer, right? And he's an arsonist, a drug dealer a stalker and a murderer, right? You know, and I used to tell my mom, somebody needs to kill this guy. <laughs> he needs to die. My mother, oh no, we must never say that about God. We'll never forgive <laughs> you know? My dad would say, you just, you know, you need to put him in his book. I mean, what do you want me to do? I choke him out <laughs> and he comes back to the, the next day for more. I mean, what am I going to do? <laughs> All right, so what do you do about real bullies? I mean, I mean, there's a difference between taunting, right, mm -hmm. uh, and um, disciplining, and uh, and all the games we play, and right. in fact, mm -hmm. being fucking and horrible person. boundary setting and all that kind of stuff all coming to play there too, right? You're you're setting boundaries when you deploy violence as well, right? You're letting him know he crossed the line. Right, but I, but I get I get what you're what you're asking. You know, if I'm trying to address the objection of right, yeah, you, it, 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 torture really does exist. Social torture does exist. Right. Yeah. Right? And and if we were in a healthy place where we were teaching restraint rather than rather than nonviolence, right? Then everybody would be applying that to this kid, and he would be being pushed further and further out of the group that he exists in if he didn't adapt and change behavior. Because everybody would be extending that. So you're saying is there's an escalation? There has to be an escalation. Yes. Path out of the problem. Well, the, the, the the group then starts. Well, to, my escalation going, path was going, my dad showed up and knocked on. Well, so. My dad showed up and knocked on your door, and that was really fucking scary. <laughs> I remember, I remember Ms. McKenna coming over because my, uh, my this this older kid and I got in a fight and uh, and my father said to her in front of her kid, "If you aren't out fucking and whoring all at, at every bar in town, you would you'd be taking care of your kids and they wouldn't behave like this." Oh, whoa, Dad! <laughs> So I think that, you know, there's a value of the S, God, you know, see, we used to be able to do like normal stuff like that, right? Just solve problems. I mean, imagine if you did that. You see that woman that was on one of the uh, news reports, some woman caused her eight-year-old boy, told her eight-year-old boy to walk their last half mile home through a rel half, uh, half mile home um, because he was being so disruptive to the other kids in the car and they arrested her and threatened her with jail for it. Well, like half my home, I used to, when I was a fucking kindergarten, I used to walk the two miles to the lake right. through the whole fucking yeah. Yeah. <laughs> when the, it, that You know, and because, because we've lost the development of restraint, we don't have access to proportionality. So you see things like that happen. So you have to, have, without proportionality, you have to, you're stuck with absolutes. Right. And our law is becoming more and more absolute rather than proportional.
we're failing, we're continuing to fail to develop restraint. Because it's not restraint if you can't say no. If you don't have a choice, it's not, you're pra not practicing restraint. <laughs> we all think that we're practicing restraint, right? Because we're not doing these things. But it's, we're not doing them because we don't have an option to do them. So it's not restraint. It's just restraint. Right. It's straight. We don't have restraint. We just have strains. <laughs> You really have solved the problem, you know. That you have really solved. I only took it to we have to restore the duel. You've really taken it all the way down. You have to, like, you have to get some real kudos for solving that problem, dude. And he's like, well, I'm fucking awesome. Luke, this is Luke, right? Well, I'm fucking awesome. You should expect me to solve the hard problem because I'm fucking awesome. <laughs> Sorry, man. I just have to I have to love the and love you and mess with the same time where it feels like they've set the universe out of balance. Right, yeah. I, I couldn't accept it any other way. So. <laughs> I don't I don't I, I don't even recognize a compliment unless there's a <laughs> So it's a, it's a I'm trying to I'm trying to figure out how to logically express it is is like it's like not just to be a negativa it's like um that's two steps in logic like what Brandon was saying earlier well you know like Brandon, I can't remember what Brandon was saying earlier and I'm thinking to myself well fuck man we can't get anybody to understand the first we can't we can't get we can basically get people to understand one step in logic. We can't get people to understand one negative step in logic. How the fuck are we going to get people to understand two negative steps? You know, uh, a, a negative logic and its reversal. Like, okay, this is like, <laughs> it's like all of a sudden you're up into we need a story and we need a rule. <laughs> and I'm we're thinking, I'm thinking the same thing as you're talking. I'm like, how are we gonna how are we gonna reduce that? Well, I mean, you can you can tell the story and you can uh, explain it, but if you want to express it logically, it's a negative of a negative, I mean, uh, producing a positive by a negative of a negative, and it's like, okay, well, that's that's great, but we can't we can't express it as logic very easily. We have to find some way of telling it as a story. I've been sorry, I'm a little obsessed with this problem lately because it's be what I'm seeing is how. It's not just cognitive bias you have to overcome or moral. No, it's not just moral bias. It's just not cognitive bias. It's like they fucking can't do it, right? They just can't do it, right? It's not It's not possible for them to understand it. So these people have to have stories. And so now you're into the, yeah, of course, that's why, why norms, traditions, values, new thoughts, they trickle down because they have to. <laughs> they have to turn, right? <laughs> It has to trickle down. So fucking annoying, man. It's like a miracle we could do anything. We could just, just amazing we could do anything. So but you know, th 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 what you're talking about now, that's why I, I wrote what I wrote, <laughs> is because people can't make the leap from we think we're doing cooperation to we have to do violence. So what yes. I had to do with this, the, the thing that I put together was provide a path to avoidance, not even to violence. How right. do I get, how do I, because the whole purpose is to, is to maintain the opportunity for cooperation, right? I mean, that's that's everything we're doing here builds builds towards that, right? Otherwise, yeah, why are we doing it? Right? Um, so, so if I can't get people to directly to violence, then I have to get them to that middle step of can they just choose something other than cooperation, and that something other than cooperation has to then be avoidance or boycott or being able to say no, right? That, that's, that's you can't say no, it's not cooperation. Right, exactly. That. So that's what that's why I had to write what I write is so that they, because they, I don't think I can get them right, right, right to violence yet. That's the next step. But first I got to be able to just get them to say no to cooperation, get them to a point where they can recognize they can say no to whatever they're being presented so that it becomes cooperation again. <laughs> What's the point of sovereignty, right? Right. That's what an outlaw means. 
Okay, well, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna violate the principle of reciprocity. Therefore, I am outside the law. And I've taken it before the court jury of my peers, and they've said I'm outside the law. Well, I have two choices. I can pay the restitution, or it's open season on my ass. Right, and that and that's, that means. <laughs> that, and that's that, and that's really the answer to bullying, is that that's the childhood version of becoming an outlaw. Okay, that I know that's the right answer. I'm just trying to work through it. It's like yeah. being like the monarchies. The church had to just say, "Well, these guys aren't legit rulers." Right. And then it just means it's open season on your ass. Right. Which you don't want to have happen because everybody next right. around you is a greedy fucker, too. So what's well, the same thing with kids is like. Well, you know, you're going to say you're going to be an outlaw well, it's open season on you, kid. Well, and it works better in a community, right? Because then the, the people that own the stores and whatnot, they're like, you can't come in here. I don't trust you in here because I've witnessed your behavior over X period of time, right? And it expands and expands and expands and they become more and more proportional, proportionally, right? I mean, the, the adults need to be applying proportionality to this, but it, you know, eventually the whole community is looking at this kid going, you don't get to be part of this community anymore because you won't change your behavior. Yeah. So you know, we need to restore not only the virtue of violence to enable the choice, we need to restore um uh, voluntary association and disassociation, and we need to restore ostracization. Well, I mean, that's the, that's the got to be able to say no, to to say no. <laughs> at all scales. <laughs> See, only way uh, we can keep cooperating. It'd be interesting for you to to hear to see if we could take uh, and say that as the take your idea and say as the virtue of violence. And turn it into 12 points. I'm not sure I could do it without you. But that's how you make it stick. <laughs> well, you're in your book, you work through it, but there's, there, I would like an, an, an analytic version. Yeah, yeah. So would I. The, the book was for, for not us. We were not the, the target audience. Oh, no, I, I understand <laughs> that. I think, so now that that's there, how do you make, how do you make the analytic yeah, a statement because I I I think that's every you guys every time I talk to you fucking guys I get more work I don't so, but I would think that would be that would be a that would live that analytic statement would live for ten thousand years would be a really long that one doesn't go cold that's like the it's like a right up there with the Ten Commandments. mirror it with a female. That's really fascinating. Okay. Sorry, I didn't mean to drag it off in the abstract, but that was that's a really cool path to take. And now I see your it pairs with your what was your original insight? How did you just frame it? Uh, autonomy. You mean forbearance? Forbearance. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's all it's all connected in my head so no, no i mean the, the logic consistency is there it's a very it's very interesting because i'm definitely in the uh, libertarian tradition of trying to find a neutral measure but you're actually saying how to become a man <laughs> right i mean it's, it's just very interesting I'm saying I'm saying how to become an adult. <laughs> well, I mean that's the same thing, isn't it? Sorry, I had to say. I think that. I think men and women I could, both I could get I couldn't let that opportunity fly by right. without saying that. That's just too, too. <laughs> that was just too too choice. <laughs> yes, I'm trying to decide how to be a judge. In other words, I want to know how to judge. And you're saying, here's what that you gets a, That gets a lot easier when people grow up. Children are hard to parse from criminals. Oh, oh my God. 
Jesus, that's that just that's got a lot of fucking mileage on it. Down. Shut up. <laughs> most, most 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 people that call themselves adults these days are criminal because they're stealing from our children. They're stealing the forbearance. That's we true. Can you explain that? Well, yeah. I mean, <laughs> my my big gripe about all this, what what has me on this path, is that we for, forbearance is a positive virtue, right? It, it's a thing that we need that we require in order to in order to provide the forgiveness that's required for cooperation to maintain cooperation to keep cooperation as an opportunity, right? <laughs> For, for cooperation, right? Our children are in a, con in a state of constant forbearance. We're, we're, they're continuously making errors. They're continuously screwing things up. They're continuously externalizing costs. And as, our, as the adults or the people that in their lives that, are, that you know, who they're important, that, who, who those kids are important to, we're constantly extending to them forbearance, right? And as, as we're watching childhood being extended further and further into adulthood, you know, the, the, the behavioral flexibility, the trappings of childhood, you know, all these things that we're extending to adults, all of that is doing is is taking or expanding the cost of forbearance to those adults when that cost should be limited to children. So they are stealing our forbearance, right? I'll, every, every time you hear somebody say the word for the audience, every time you hear the word say, say tolerance when they're talking about a social issue, what they're actually talking about is forbearance. They're just they're, they're ambiguating for forbearance, say to, to, to distance it from the costs, right? You, when we're tolerating something, we're paying a cost to tolerate it, right? That cost is what I define as forbearance, right? We're, we're extending that, or we're paying the cost for somebody else's forbearance. But it, we should be our, our kids should be getting the, the the bulk of that forbearance. Then it's young adults, right? It, it, again, proportionality it scales as people get older. Right? We, the the four of us. Need to need to offer very little forbearance to each other because we're not externalizing costs upon each other, mm -hmm. right? We're, we're we're responsible enough to not be doing that. It's it's it, it's you know it should be inversely proportional to our an individual's level of responsibility. The more responsibility mm -hmm. they, they are, the less forbearance they need extended to them, right? So so mm -hmm. as, as adults <laughs> who ought to be demonstrating responsibility aren't. They're stealing our capacity for forbearance from our children. We can't demonstrate the capacity for responsibility. And when we call them on that, they demand that we be tolerant instead. Don't impose those costs on us. <laughs> so uh, uh, that, left. Go ahead, Martin, please. They're, they're obviously implying that there are no costs. Right, that's yes. What that's what, yeah, that's what, that's the distinction. That's what tolerance does. It implies there is no cost. Whereas forbearance accounts for the costs. Yeah, co costs are just a conspiracy theory. Right, exactly. And you're and you're an evil bigot for even suggesting they exist. We wouldn't have a nightmare now. It's a thorny problem, right? I mean, because these kids grew up without being taught how to become adults. At the same time, they're adults now. The, 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 it is their responsibility. The, 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 does the opposition have any visibility yet into the fact that they're producing the exact opposite of their... No. because They, it's they don't have any idea. It's, attention. it's the attention market. Right? They're still trying to garner attention. And what Luke is saying is like, you're trying to pull attention to you and not redistributing that attention to children for their betterment. You're not doing your job, are you? Or that they're, they're undoing about hundreds of centuries, yes. many yeah. centuries of, of trying to show women are due equal respect. Yeah, right? yeah it's terrible. Uh, or that I mean, or that they're undoing their argument against paternalism. Like we're sitting here, relic willing to get into reciprocity, building a framework for reciprocity. We're opening the door for everybody, and they're undoing it right back to the. It, they're you're pulling it out root and stem. What they're saying they're going to end up with is. <laughs> The, the 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 female is intrinsically evil beyond its scope of conflict. 
the scope of intuition. What the fuck? The cognitive, the feminine is is pet, Pandora is the is the least of it. I mean, we have female gods, right? And they're not bad. We had them, right? Mm -hmm. They're not necessarily good either. Say the same thing about a lot of the male gods. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, the male gods are just true. <laughs> a, a, a pantheon ought to, you know, be a, a expression of all of the traits of humanity, right? I mean, exactly. that's what a pantheon represents. So we should be covering everything in a pantheon. So I would expect to see some very terrible things and some very wonderful things in any pantheon. And the problem is the road to hell is paved with good with the pretense of good intentions obscured by the false promise of freedom for the laws of the universe. Right. When those laws of the universe tell us there's only one choice, and that's cooperation if we want to survive. And we want it to cooperation by the terms of the universe, not in the way avoid the suffering. Every kid thinks they can run away until they get hungry. Yes. And the left is just that mindset at scale. I made it down the street once. And my mother stood in the front door of the house, looking down the street, laughing at me. Right. Very humiliating. <laughs> Very English <laughs> point. <laughs> Very humiliating. It's like the first time I came home drunk with the spins and I'm laying down in bed, my father opens the door, looks at me, and he just starts laughing at me. Right now, you could have got angry, right? And whatever. No. What was more fucking humiliating? Laughing at you. Okay? Yeah. When I was a little kid and I think I'm going to run away, what's more humiliating? My parents laughing at me. Right. It's just very humiliating. It's like okay, lunch will be here when you when you get back. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it just feels so stupid. <laughs> okay, so wow, we went on a long journey there. I know there's just so much more meat to be found on this subject. I just can't, I can't, can't ant, put it into an old form off the top of my head right now. So, the, the, so what makes, so we know what our religion requires. It has to produce mindfulness. <laughs> which allow, facilitates cooperation by the same system of measurement. My eradication of um, basically fear uh, of uh, oppression, rejection. In other words, trying to produce trust. And beyond the scale of the band, the tribe, And you're trying to support that we're in the band of tribe that continually enforced. Once we scale up, we need a system of measurement to compensate for our increased uncertainty. And especially when it gets really large, our, our sense of alienation, which is evokes the being left behind response, which is terrifying to all of us. We know that from our study of religions, they contain a metaphysics, in other words, an organization of the world. They contain a mythology. Excuse me, a, a, a metaphysics. Excuse me, a, a group strategy. That group strategy contains a metaphysics. Metaphysics is expounded by a narrative, mythology. 
is supported by a system of argument, in other words, a sort of logic, and a series of people who produce uh, reforms or adaptations of that hierarchy in response to evolutionary changes and circumstances of the people. That's religion. Now, in order to make it persist, you need to add rituals. And a ritual ritual includes a debt, which is how you and you cause it to the submission response and the willingness to pay it. And it requires a celebration of feast which is the way you restore equality to the people despite their alienation and separation. <laughs> That's what a religion does. Um, this allows this, uh, so that is, that is what a religion consists of. So, the old, so there's nothing we're missing from creating a true religion other than to work on the archetypes and the organization of archetypes and the uh, version of history consisting of the parables that you know, so it's just a narrative problem and so the, we can look at Whig history as an attempt to do that and we look at okay so basically Europeans the the, the Really, the industrial revolution really fucked us up. It came just way too fast because it, it impeded our formation. Because by the the Germans were really close to restoring class classicism, right? Uh, that's where you get Wagner. Right? You got the, the the romantic artists restoring classicism, the heroic you got Nietzsche restoring classicism. Um, so you restoring the heroic issue we have uh, and so it's all working really awesome and then we have the world wars and then as martin is always saying the uh, the, the um or so one of the guys is saying i think it's scott strong maybe that the uh holocaust takes over as a christ myth of uh, victim 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 uh, narrative instead of the heroic narrative. And so what we're trying to do is restore European and what Luke is saying is that you have to restore the masculine, which is another way of saying what Nietzsche was saying is the masculine. And he was trying to do it in religious terms. So we just sort of fucked up there. And we've let this the Marxism take root, and then we let race Marxism in and cultural Marxism in, and they've managed to undermine this. We've seen the combination of the uh, Jewish uh, undermining with feminist, feminism to pick up the females, what, not causing enough protection to use democracy to bring about um, the march of the institutions. And what we are doing is we are observing all the failures of that, doing an analysis of it, and trying to restore the project. What I learned from Luke today is that while I am sufficiently trying to restore neutrality, that isn't sufficient to restore masculinity, when masculinity is essentially adulting and paternalism is just making adults. So the people who were telling me earlier, you're not taking it far enough. And I was getting annoyed because I said, well, I'm not trying to solve that problem. I'm only trying to solve this issue. We have to, in other words, the issue of solidarity. That isn't actually sufficient. We have to restore responsibility, which is restoring adulthood, which is restoring masculinity. Because unless you have those things, you're not actually in control enough. Sorry, I just had to work through that. Does that make any sense to you? Yeah, no, you got it. So we need to, oh, fuck, it's so, so we have to retry, I'm restoring the judicial of the trifunctional model, but we have to restore the religion and the masculinity, the martialness to produce all, the tri, restore the trifunctionalism, right? So that's what we're actually, that's what's bobbing around in this conversation. 
that I'm like, if something's going on here and I can't, I can't put my arms around it. <clears throat> something happening here. And I'm listening to Luke and I'm like, he's, he's got a piece of, where does that, that, that there's some, that fits somehow. <laughs> I, can't, I couldn't put it all together. That's, that's it. So we need the trifunctional model. We need the religion, the masculinity and the neutrality. And so, okay. Sorry. Did I, did I, I'm sorry if I was. Well, you can be unfit for being judged. We well, put those people. You can be unfit for being judged. We put those people down, right? Fitness is demonstrated. You're going to be judged. That's what this place is telling you. That's what's being you washed can't, out. You can't produce trifunctionalism without the, the law, right? You can't. You get monopoly, right? That's the mm -hmm. problem, right? And you, yes. One thing what the law says is it says we're neutral. It's a, that's why it's a balanced scale. We're neutral. Um and so you have, but but we got, then we got to work on. I got to take Luke's personal and make it political. You just use the economy. We, we, it's three, on, it's three talking, economies, huh? It's three economies, and you can't afford a negative externality of any that impact the others. Yes. So there's only three realms of interaction. So you can't operate in the realm of caring for one another if it undermines production or protection, your defense. Same yeah. with the other, same with the other realms. You have to have the equilibrium between the, the religion, the military, and the law. So we've just reconfirmed reconfirmed tri European trifunctionalism is why it's so evolution it's so subject to evolutionary computation or evolution velocity. <laughs> Is because it provides an equilibrium of sidability between the three axes. I got a, I got more out of this fucking conversation. Holy shit! Well, it's usually the production and the defense, the men, the military moving forward and dragging the back end of the triangle, right? Well, which is obvious, space, right? Because it's which is obvious, of course. <laughs> <clears throat> But the thing about our military is that it's sovereign. And so there's no authority, mm -hmm. right? And so in the absence of authority, you have to have the other. It's, it's, so you don't get, why do they think that European, this is something that I, I've struggled with. Historians talk about all our silly wars in Europe, right? As if that's a bad thing. Like, mm -hmm. did you see like what they did in China? during the Warring States period. And what happened because India didn't have them? And what happened because Islam couldn't have them? I mean, you're not looking at the, it's like, it's not taking a full accounting of what happens if you don't have those wars. Those wars are just computation, but they're computation on the right under neck, under decidability, which is the opposite, right? It's only the French that ruined it, except now they these idiots walk around and say the French were good. Or the French method was good. And they're the ones that fucking ruined it. Which is my today's today's opportunity for me to shit on the French for getting everything wrong all the time. Why? Because they're feminine. What does that mean? They're authoritarian. <laughs> Did you see my speech on gutter my my piece on French is just gutter German? I I I just love that. I'm gonna we learn, look at the genetics and the French are just Germans. And so the French language is just a gutter German. I just, I just love that. I just love, I'm going to, I'm going to milk that for the rest of my life. It's going to make me laugh every single time I think about it. I mean, it sounds like a faggot. Language. Oh, excuse me. It sounds like an effeminate language, right? Come on, guys. I mean, I was, uh, this is, I get I get a lot of positive feedback for crapping on the French, at least in Americans. There's no disagreement there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Wow. My head's good. My head exploded enough for one day. All right. So, um, what else did I want to talk about this week? I don't even care about the election stuff, right? I don't care about Trump. 
I care. Um, I suppose that's a good topic. Like people could be exhausted on him. He's been in this, the limelight for about eight years straight now. I don't know if people are taking that into account. Too many people behind him. I don't know. So I, I can't. I'm waiting to see if the party parasitizes itself because they shouldn't run primaries. What do you mean they shouldn't run primaries? I mean, they should unify behind Trump and win instead of acting like retards. But they're not going to do that. So I'm waiting to see what the chimpanzee show is going to be like. I have no... I know what he's capable of if he's let loose. And I have... I know what the extreme of his future could be. In other words, what he could pull off. And so I have no fucking idea what's going to happen. <laughs> it's a big field of opportunity out there, all dependent upon how much he wants to double down. Or not. Um, uh, I kind of like, no matter what happens, for them to do what you're suggesting, is that you know, the Republican Party becomes the America First Party, you know, so to speak, the Trump class, the middle class, working class majority. Or uh, I'd like it to burn hard and have to reform. But I don't see the numbers anymore. I, don't see. I see a lot of agents. I see a lot of, agent, a lot of agents and agency is trapped in politics, meaning if someone like DeSantis runs against Trump, the, the split in the party will be horrific because yeah. it's going to be the blue working class against the, the uh, upper middle class, like credentialed yeah. people, right? The intellectuals, the people who say things. So it's the people who say things against the people who don't. Yeah. It's the worst type of split inside of a party that you could ask for. <laughs> one of the things that I'm being entertained by right now that, that the credential class within the Republican Party is doing the same thing to Trump now that that the left's credential class did the last time around and, and with the same results, right? I mean, they, they're they talking about him nonstop, which is what he got them got the left to do. <laughs> and then they're complaining about his mean tweets because he says things about DeSantis. <laughs> right? So it's like the, the right's talking heads are doing all the same, making all the same mistakes about him that the left's talking heads made because well, we're all free to wield that feminine violence we were talking about for so long this whole chat right all of the all the credentialed institutions all of the religions that are currently popular and so on like they all over they all overdo the feminine they all do a lot of talking and a lot of attention seeking and a lot of watching things burn down And they're happy to contribute to the burning of them to the burning of things. Go ahead, Martin. Just saying there's no meaningful distinction between the two parties. Correct. Which is why the Democrats are doing the right thing, which is to get votes from people who are non-participatory most of the time, which is what the Republicans should have did this whole time. The last two to four years. They should have been going after those who are not voting and telling them how they're being dis disserviced by the political people mm-hmm. well that's that's my biggest argument for trump is that's what he brings out for the, the Republican i agree party. with that he doesn't capture an existing voting block he brings out people that otherwise wouldn't vote for anybody he's the only bringing people who are non-participatory which are the good people right well, the bad people are participating in politics incentives aren't right for good people so there's very few of them well and just to, to circle it back to the conversation we, we were having earlier right um, anyone that believes that the narrative about the, the january 6th stuff right they don't understand that if he actually asked for an insurrection he would get it and, right. we, and it would be over right but a right. real one like i mean yeah, these yeah. guys showed up fully armed to to do all the business right he could ask for that and get it so the people that 
buy into the January 6th stuff, they don't recognize the conditions of restraint that exist in the in his current approach. Yes. I mean, you can't believe the January 6th narrative without that ignorance. I, I also just like him being there because he makes all the right people's heads explode. Yeah, so I don't, I don't even right. care about policy stuff. I want him there and running and in the position for that reason alone. He does more damage to the cathedral <laughs> than anybody else just by existing. <laughs> I think the midterms was a turning point, meaning I was under the impression before the midterms that the majority of people still wanted to be reasonable to solve things and it seems like the majority opinion now is on both sides is we'd like to be unreasonable. And that could have happened a little them. bit sooner. But now we just have to teach them how to be unreasonable. Well, yes, it's a, it's a different problem when you're dealing with people who want to be unreasonable than you're dealing with people who want to be reasonable. Yeah, correct. <clears throat> I mean, how would I even express reasonableness in that election? Yeah, they, you can't. Uh, I, I think those that stayed home are pretty reasonable. I agree. What was participation like? Does anyone know? I don't know off the top of my head. 100 million? That's not right. the down there that I'm asking. From the last midterm or from the last election? From the last election. The numbers I was looking at, it was, it was pretty consistent with previous midterms, not with the last election. Yeah, that's... The last election was pretty record setting. This midterm was pretty, pretty comparative, G given population growth and stuff like that, right? I mean, it's pretty comparable to other midterm elections. And the right got the popular vote by something like 5 million or something like that, didn't they? Yeah, yeah, which is unusual. Which is unusual, correct. I was reading one uh, one piece that was taking a look at the the, the demographics of the, of the vote, and and it was you know they were expecting a lot more younger kids to show out because of the the Roe versus Wade decision and stuff like that. And, 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 decision like that. and, it, and that didn't actually manifest. It, it looked like it was the older the older ladies that came out stronger, you know, in force for the the the, the the Dobbs decision because of that, right? So it was the it was it was the hippies that usually aren't engaged in politics, right? the old hippies, the bra burners that came out to to reiterate their support for that. They didn't want the future to lose that. And of course, we see that in all the metrics, right? It's it's the unmarried females that or the unmarried women that are swinging so hard for the left, and that showed up big in this this election cycle. So. I, I don't believe anything I'm hearing because I can't it's not you're not far enough along after the election for me to right. no. trust anyone um, but yeah the turnout looks like it was really high it's uh, not quite as high as uh, 18 but many times but um, Damn me. So a lot of people came out. I'm, a, I'm looking for the. I mean, all, what I care about is the only numbers I care about because they tell me everything I need to know is how did white men vote? No, well, they voted in mean, the fucking country's red. And the only reason, uh, you better understand the reason that um, this is really offensive but to some people, but Washington and, and um, Oregon don't come out as red is because they're vastly, the, you know, it's a thin strip here, but they had racist laws there <laughs> until very recently in time. So they never got the, they never got the um, uh, killing of the cities effect that happened in the rest of the country. So they're still more optimistic. <laughs> 
and uh, you know, and, and then the second thing is, where did the you had the the druggies go to L.A., the hippies go to uh, Oregon, and the yuppies go to go to Washington, and so you have these three three rebellious factions, just like you had the crazies go to Florida, which at least Floridians talk about, right? There's a certain a certain every these that mass migration that happened at post war it it uh, through the 60s 70s and 80s it it really affected these particular areas so when i look at that out in the west i'm like well they just don't know any i mean i i live there right so they just don't know any better um so um and furthermore they're more they're, they're founded by scandinavians especially Seattle, Scandinavian. So they're fucking foolishly optimistic anyway. Did I slam the Scandinavians there? Did I do a good job of it? Um, so, you know, you sort of expect that kind of granola nonsense to happen out there. But the one that bothers me is Maine. I mean, I, I don't get Maine other than it's poor. I mean, Maine's basically as poor as Mississippi. <laughs> So, but I mean, the rest of the country is totally red. So the only thing that matters then is why why is white women defect in such white numbers? Well, it's not white women; it's single white women who've gone down, or single white women. But when I look at the number of single white women, right, and the number of minorities and how they vote, I mean, it's just, once you've got our population below you know below eighty percent white, it's deterministic. You're going to get this effect, and so what bothers me is people think anybody's persuadable, and I just don't see people persuadable except anything except really tangible things like pocketbooks. And unless we get into an economic crisis of some sort, um, where parties can try to solve that by two different means, I don't, I don't know how any, I don't know how conservatives get elected anymore. I, I just don't, I don't see it. So I'm kind of looking at this as like, I just don't care anymore because I don't see a vehicle to victory that's by political means, which I think we've talked about already. Um, so the, the, the uh, I'm interested in the Elon Musk topic. Can I talk about that? The Twitter topic? Because I'm involved in Twitter right now. And what's interesting is I bought, a, I bought a lot of companies, right? I started out, when I was in my 20s, I was buying companies. Right? So I bought a lot of companies. And you know, especially in my 30s and 40s, about a lot of tech companies, like a couple hundred of them. And so, you know, you look at this and it's like, well, what do you do when you buy a tech company? There are people who want the deal and people who don't want the deal in every company. What is your job? Get rid of the people who don't want it. Right? It's not fucking complicated. Now, when you're trying, you buy a tech company, who matters? The engineers. <laughs> what percentage of engineers matter? 10% of engineers, right? So what matters in the whole company? 10% of engineers. Now, when you buy a company like that, what can you, when you look at most companies, look at a company like Twitter, which is really poorly run, right? I mean, it's not profitable, and hasn't really made any progress and isn't going anywhere, but it's just a vehicle for public malfeasance, right? When you look at a company like Twitter, how many people really matter? Well, I mean, when you start to look at a company like that, you could double the salary of that of that top 10% of engineers. They'll actually do more work than the than than the than they would have with the rest. Right. And as for everybody else, the truth is they don't matter. Now uh, I would I gotta look at Twitter's uh, tech stack and the size of it. Took some work, by the way. <laughs> the whole problem, the whole problem at Twitter, has been solving scale. Almost nothing they do has been to improve the AI, the algorithm, whatever. It's all the tech stack is about scale, which is a domain unspecific problem. It's just a, in other words, it's not a business problem. It's a it's a tech problem. And if you look at the stack they used, it's deterministic. 
they're just using the best things from the veil because they have the, the ability and money to. Them. And so they've solved the skill problem. So I'm just looking at this thing and I'm like saying, I would do exactly what Musk is doing. And especially because you're Musk, right? What would he do if he wanted to hire? He wanted, you know, 400 of the best engineers. You don't need that many. Right? That means probably needs 200. Right? What do you do? Just say, I want to. <laughs> I mean, I just don't see the problem here. Yet, I see all these people saying, "Well, people are going to feel like people are going to like." You know, you're you're talking like women. This is where I went with it, because I found a, a pretty good woman who was giving me feedback last night. I said, "You're talking like women in HR department, as if it as if the the majority matters. They don't." Power laws apply in every human organization, right? The top 20% provide 80% of the value and the other people are just, frankly, disposable. The only reason you don't dispose them is that it costs money to advertise, interview, <laughs> hire, give them 30 days of experience. <laughs> in other words, they're not, they have no partic particular value other than the transaction costs of replacing. <laughs> and of those top 20% of the people, uh, the top 20% of those people provide 80% of the value. And of the top, that top 20%, 20% of those people. What you find out in all these companies is that it's just a handful of people that provide all the value. And uh, it's an increasing curve, right? But you provide all the value. And so that's why it's you, it so much matters in a tech company like uh, Tesla or SpaceX that you get the best people you can. Or in the case of SpaceX, you have to make them because nobody from the fucking industry would come over. Well, Musk had to become the top engineer at SpaceX in order to train <laughs> the engineers at SpaceX to the point where now they can hire top engineers. Well, the same thing happened in Tesla, right? So I'm like, you're betting against a guy who solved the fucking rocket science problem, the the bat the battery manufacturing problem in the dumbest fucking problem he's ever had to solve. Right? I mean, I, I'm like, why are you betting against that? Now they say we're gonna make Twitter better, except that he's come out and said what he wants with Twitter, which is to make at least WeChat which we don't have an equivalent of. I mean, if you're in Asia, you don't really need to do anything except have your phone with you. You don't need credit cards, anything, right? And it all works in the same system, right? And, and it's not, you don't have to learn these disparate systems and keep track of them and defend against, you know, all these uh, hacks and shit, right? It's all in this one system. So that's what he wants to do with Twitter is the baseline. And why does he want to do that? Because then there's no need for advertising and bias, advertiser bias to interfere with the, the um, presentation of information. And the next thing he wants to do is make it so you and I can subscribe to feeds that we want. So I'm like, I just don't understand this, all this drama when it, I just don't, there's just no reason for it. I mean, and he has plenty of money. He can just, even if the thing, thing loses money for two years, he's got plenty of money for it. Who cares? Anyway, so I'm just wondering if anybody could explain to me why the Vox Populi thinks this is so such a – that they just don't understand how companies work? Is that what it is? Uh, no, they're just the 80% of people that lose their jobs when problems get solved. You ever done an acquisition or been in an acquisition, Luke? You must have been. Yeah. Yeah. What was your experience? Was it good, bad, different? Um, it's I don't know. It just seemed kind of routine. Yeah. <laughs> right. It, 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 all the all the pieces made sense, right? All the steps made sense, right? It was yes. Exactly how you describe them. So. I've had everything from. You're going to kill our culture. Right, because we're responsible. Yeah. 
<laughs> Maybe you say, if you, you know, if you were making money, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> right. <laughs> to, if your, if your, oh if my your God, culture was successful. Oh my God, we're going to have a CEO that actually understands products. <laughs> you know, thank you for hiring us. I've had the whole, the whole spectrum. But normally, uh, what you what I would do is bring in uh, people, and say, uh, and do a whiteboard, and I tell them the truth. Okay. This is the truth, <laughs> and then my people go out and talk to all the other people and try to explain it to them. And so, if I'm going to have a marketer, I bring marketers. If I have tech people, I bring tech people. Project manager, product, creatives, creatives. I bring people from across the business, so those people have somebody that speaks their language. Talk to them, because mostly what you do. When you find a company that needs help, is you're fixing operations, right? And you're taking the this the you're you're uh, taking money and devoting it to sales. Right? That, right. Operations and overhead. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And then you're going through the company. You're finding people that that I usually call it political, but they have alliances, but they're not adding value. <laughs> And those people have to generally go. But, you know, most of my equity, I've had really only a couple. Well, I've had only one fail. And the only reason it failed is because um, I bought it to save a friend of mine's ass. In other words, I didn't expect it to work out. I just was trying to save a friend of mine. It didn't work, it didn't work out, but I tried. Anyway. What's the difference between buying a company and buying a company and choosing a school for your kids? Written in. <clears throat> Same fucking problem. Anyway, um, so that was the Musk thing. We talked about the politics thing, the war thing. There's nothing really going on there. I think the only thing I want to say about the war is they're over. Can't. You can't underestimate the Russian people's ability to suffer and the Russian government's willingness to allow them to. Uh, and so I just see this as not going anywhere. Those are my only topics for today. Luke already made my head explode, so I have nothing else to do. So are we done? Anybody else? Guys? Martin? Yeah. Covered a lot. All right, guys. Love you. Thank you for today. It's uh, Thursday, November 17th, 2022. This has been our staff meeting. And uh, like, subscribe, uh, comment, um, make fun of someone. You know, love you all. Take care. <laughs>